two. And we welcome you to this edition of the Plate Meeting Podcast powered by Close Call Sports. I am Tim McCaffrey. Some of you will call me T-Mac or other names that we can't say over some of these airwaves. I'm joined by Gil, who is running the controls. And uh, also joining us is Jeff Gosney, an umpire in the SEC and the ACC. And he's uh, part of the Director of Training Development for UCU, which I believe is Big South, ACC, and Conference USA. Just correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, at 85, guys. UTD, I'm sorry. And, and uh, Brian DeBrow, our other guest, that's UCU. There are so many. When I look at the, uh, the, the write-up, there's so many initials that we did. Is that United Collegiate Umpires? Okay. So I get con- all the initials. I'm having a little brain freeze. I've been looking at about 100 plays over the last uh, 48 hours to try to get some, some ones. that. So here's what we're doing here, folks. This is Brian DeBrower and Jeff Gosney doing teachables with maybe some discussion and maybe some fun. I don't know if it's going to work. This is what we call in the trade a pilot. So let's see how it goes. If it crashes and burns, you may never get to see this. So let's, first of all, thank our sponsor, our great people at the OSIP Foundation, uh, who have stayed with us through this pandemic, and we can't thank them enough. The Plate Meeting Podcast is brought to you by the OSIP Foundation Incorporated, where OSIP stands for Outstanding Sportsmanship is Paramount. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting good sportsmanship throughout sports and competition. Among their many programs offered is Officials Anonymous, a hotline and support service for officials who suffer from abuse, anxiety, and other similar issues. To learn more about OSIP or to get involved or even to donate, please visit OSIPFoundation.org. Your donation may be tax deductible. Once again, that's OSIPFoundation.org. So first of all, my apologies, Brian DeBrower of UCU, the Director of Training Development, and Jeff Gosney, the Director of Training. So we basically got, you know, what is this, Brian, uh, Jeff, like 10 or 11 conferences that you guys help with the training of. So this is a, uh, I would say, a, a pretty star-studded event. So here's what we're doing. First of all, welcome to the show. Thank you. So we're going to, go ahead, Brian. I said, I appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. We're going to go one by one here. So we're going to look at the play, and we're going to look at it just like it would be the first time seeing. Of course, a lot of these plays we've seen before. And then we're going to break it down from a perspective. Uh, we're going to generally do this from a college perspective. If there's some rule interpretation that might be different from a professional or Gil, maybe from a high school perspective, so that's more your, you, you, you know, you, you know all three, then we'll go at it. So let's take a look at the first play, Gil Imber. All right. Well, we shared the screen in rehearsal and it worked out okay. So hopefully it does in the recording session too. Here's the first play. with a runner on first base and two outs. And it seems like, you know, it's a one of those under 18U games or 17U, Brian, that I know you do a lot of looking at. But we're going to go to uh, Jeff Gosney here. Jeff, if you were at a camp and you saw the plate umpire uh, doing this, what were some of the things you would tell him in a private discussion? Uh, define private. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> If it's just one on one, there might be a few more uh, adjectives uh, put in this. But no, let's look at this. Uh, a, a few things, you know, mechanically and, uh, and both rule wise here. Um, he initially it looks like a two umpire system, initially does a good job starting to rotate, um, reads the entire situation, stops. Uh, but I think first and foremost, you know, we want to try to get back to the plate quicker. Um, he stops probably, you know, a third of the way up and the runner's already rounded second. He's got a full head of steam towards third. At that point when he stopped, there's no way he's going to get to third for a play. So just get back to the plate. Obviously there was no play. So, you know, he made the correct read. Just get back to the point of the plate quicker so we can make a better read on a play at the plate. I don't think positioning was all that bad um, for the actual play. Now I want to look, talk a little bit more about the catcher and his actions here. So the catcher is kind of a little no man's land here. You know, not really taught what to do. And if you can pause it right here, he's actually um, – he, he made it out in front of home plate. And uh, this was a, a big thing of contention back in 2014 when the collision rule was uh, initiated by Major League Baseball. Uh, 
to talk about the catcher and, and what is and isn't legal. And it started out as a memo back then. And Brian, you probably remember this, that uh, uh, Joe Torre issued it it's somewhat uh, late in the season, I think before playoffs, that uh, if the catcher starts in fair territory, meaning both feet in fair territory, left foot to the fair side of the third base foul line, that the catcher has basically given the runner a pathway. Um, coming up for the 2020 season, Major League Baseball finally put that into a, a black and white interpretation in the uh, MLB manual, um, which is good because it helps for, for all the groups that follow the OBR rules and rely on either the MLB or, or minor league manual, it's, it's easier for them to understand that than trying to explain that, you know, a memo was sent out to us at some point, date X, Y, Z. So I think initially the catcher is, is probably okay. He kind of wanders a little bit, but he does, he does start in front of home plate. And now he's moving. See right here. It, just before we started moving there and the plate umpire wasn't blocking, he's got two feet in fair territory. Now he's moving with the throw, which is completely legal in both OBR and NCAA. Um, there's the, the, the section in the – oh, in the collision rule that says, notwithstanding the above, if the throw um, takes the catcher into the pathway of the runner, i.e. hop, uh, direction, trajectory, and which th that's what this throw is doing. This throw is taking him into the pathway. Um, the runner – at this point, the runner um, – is within his rights to make contact with the catcher. Um, he helps us out by doing a legal slide, a bona fide slide, um, you know, the hip buttocks on the ground uh, right before contact. I, I wouldn't have any issue with that on the field. So I think from a rule standpoint, and Brian, you know, chime in if, if you see anything here that I'm missing. I don't think there's any violation of the collision rule here. And I think the runner did everything fine. He didn't do anything to initiate a uh, – unavoidable collision this was just uh and I, this term always just kind of bites me but it seems to be the current vernacular it's just a baseball play um so I, I don't see anything illegal here by either the catcher or the runner now before we get to the umpire brian you see anything that i might have uh, skipped over here rule wise no completely on board now from the umpire perspective here we got some issues um i think and I'll be the first to say that if you've never – and Brian and I have both a little history taking it back. We got into the game before the collision rule. So we uh, experienced full-blown train wrecks at the plate, uh, disasters at second base, third base. Um, and the first time you have one, just a full-on, full-fledged collision, it kind of catches you off guard and you kind of just kind of blank. So I'm kind of thinking that – that might be what this umpire did where it was just kind of a, uh Oh, like moment and froze and then just kind of lost track of the runner. Because as you can see here, when Gil clicks play, the runner is clearly going to touch home plate with his right hand. And Oh, go ahead. We mentioned a lot about on close call about you follow the ball about 99% of the time, except the 1% that you don't. And that's a lot of instinct here. If you're – take me through what the plate umpire should be doing once the throw is wild. We know there's some dead ball territory back there. So, Jeff, what's going through your mind once you realize, oh, shoot, the throw is wild? What should be my first thing that I'm looking at? Uh, I'm probably – I'm going to pick up the ball, and I'm probably going to start shading. That common uh, – that term that as a young umpire, you know, I was guilty of this. I didn't really understand what shading was. I taught at umpire school, and it took me a year or two to, to remember what shading was. Um, so basically he's third base line extended. You want to get to the third base side all while doing that. You can glance down at the plate and watch to see if that runner actually touches, but we should be getting some distance towards the troubled ball area. Um, and you know, I, I agree with you team Mac, hundred percent, you know, we were always instilled, keep your eye everlasting on the ball, but there are, there are few and far between, but there are times that we need to momentarily take our attention off that ball. To, um, to see what's going on here, because this, this, this is a bad miss. I mean, a miss is a miss, whether it's by, a, a, you know, a half an inch or like this. Um, but this is, this is a miss that we should not miss. And we also have to look at something here is, is 
th these players are presumably high school age. Mm -hmm. They're going to touch the plate. This isn't an under nine year old game where the kid might run halfway down and then go see a, an ice cream vendor and leave the stadium. This is a play that he's going to try to touch the plate. So we have to be somewhat aware of that. But as this goes on, I want to, as you can let it go through here, this is the part that bothers me because I, we miss calls. It happens. We can always get better from learning from them. But Bri, if you could, you know, just give me your two cents here. Let's say that that other umpire, you're that other umpire. What are you doing on this play? Yeah. Um, it looks like we're getting kind of out of control here. We've got multiple players on the field, a um, ton of people yelling at the plate umpire. And so the base umpire just kind of hung out back in the working area for a little while. And like Jeff said, you kind of get that deer in the headlights, um, shocked feeling after a collision play or something weird happens. But from the base, base umpire's perspective, you got to see that your, your plate umpire is having a hard time maintaining control of this situation and get yourself down in that direction to play rodeo clown a little bit, um, simplify the discussion between the, so that it's just between the coach and the calling umpire. And then, um, you know, if we need to move on to our crew consultation or whatever it is at that point, then we can do that. But yeah, some good rodeo clowning here would have gone a long way, I think. Gil, great spot to pause it. The plate umpire wants to get the game back going. Where is my, in this case, it's a two-man crew. Where is my first base umpire? Where should he be? Well, this is a great point. What, what, what Brian talks about in rodeo clowning, we're trying to get some of these guys that are in these horrible Houston Astros circa 1983 uniforms off the field a little bit. So we got the one guy who's in street clothes, or at least his street pants and a knee brace. He's trying to help, but that's it. Everybody else is arguing with the umpire. And even the visiting team or the team in black doesn't know what to do. They're just kind of wandering all over the field. So this is where as a partner, you can just kind of shove guys, not shove guys, but, you know, escort guys along a little bit that could have gone a long way to handling this. Is there anything in your mind, guys, that the base umpire could have done to maybe see the touch of the plate? We understand this is not something you're looking for as a base guy. Is there anything, maybe you're gathering information, you're seeing the, that team go crazy, the player goes crazy. Is there any way that you could ever change this call without – knowing a hundred percent that he's touched the plate. If I, if I'm the base umpire, um, I would, let me back up a little bit. I would hope that instinctually the base umpire would try to be picking up on this. Um, you see that this is a, a collision before the plate um, and stay focused on that try to focus on that runner and just see what he does. What uh, I would, if, if I was a base umpire, even if I was 90 feet away and I saw that runner touch the plate, I'm coming in right away to, to try and save it. Save now, my partner. I, I know that you guys have had backfields games at spring where the, the participants are not too much, you know, uh, older than, than those players and the lower level of the games that we are umpiring the more crazy plays that could happen like that one not every one of these plays is going to be uh, a crazy play some of them are routine some of them are basic and we go to a play right now on play number two Gil if you could be so inclined to play it this is uh this is one that is uh this is I found this one. Every time you look up a play on YouTube that the person, the parent, who it's called the worst call ever. <laughs> yeah, there's like a thousand one. of them. Yes, there are, but a lot of them are great teaching tools. And this is one of them. Brian, take it away. <laughs> well, first of all, I take exception to this being called the worst call ever on YouTube because, I mean, I myself have made many calls worse than this. So um, this one's not that bad. And so Jeff started with the rule on the prior one. I'm actually going to flip it around and start with um, the other side of things, which is, you know, kind of what our umpire is doing. Um, double plays are tough because we have a lot of things to think about. There's the, the play itself. Does the ball beat the runner? Um, there's the pulled foot. Does the catcher, in this case, maintain uh, the plate while he's receiving the ball? There's the transfer. Um, is he going to uh, successfully transfer the ball um, with firm and secure possession and demonstration of voluntary release. Um, and then to, ca to cap it all off, we have the force play slide rule, which at this point is um, essentially in effect at all levels, uh, some different wording from level to level, but 
<clears throat> essentially having to slide directly into a base. Um, so there's a lot going on. And I think what we see pretty clearly here from our umpire is he makes a very quick decision, right? So the play happens and before the slide is even finished and the ball is even hit the ground, we have an out call. Um, so the first and, and I think most important piece of advice that I'd give this umpire is let yourself process all of this information, right? All those things that we just talked about that you have to, you have to be worried about on this um, front end of a possible double play that's starting at the plate. We need to be able to see that, think about it, process it, and then make a ruling. And if we're starting to call the out, as soon as the ball hits the glove, we're not going to be able to let ourselves go through the rest of the, the elements of this play. So that's the first thing. Um, positioning on plays at the plate, force plays at the plate, it's, if I've been given um, advice on this, it's literally been, the, been differing advice at every stretch. And I don't know, Jeff, maybe you can, you can back me up on that. If, but it seems like every supervisor, every couple of years, we change our mind on where we're going on this play. Um, and one of the reasons is there's a ton of different things to worry about, right? So uh, we might see the slide better from one position. We might see the transfer better from another position. We might see the pulled foot better. And then at the end of it all, we also have to worry about the runner's lane violation that we might have coming up later. So um, there's, there's a ton of different elements for me. And this is my personal approach here, but like I said, I wouldn't begrudge anyone a differing approach. I'm gonna be pretty conservative um, in the point of the plate area with maybe a step towards the origin of the throw. So in this case, it'd be kind of around towards uh, first baseline extent extended because the origin of the throw is from the third base side. So I wanna, I wanna go towards the baseball there. Um, but while I'm doing that, I'm going to maintain some distance away from this play because I want to have that wide viewing angle to see all those different things. Um, what do you guys think? Any, anything, Jeff, do you have anything to add in terms of like the mechanics of umpiring that play? No, that's, and pretty much that's how we taught it at the, at umpire school when I was there, um, you know, granted five years removed, but I don't think much has changed. Uh, point of the plate is, is going to offer you the best all around, um, view for everything obviously you know if we go back to the old uh theory of seeing the ball in the glove we'd want to be third baseline extended but then we're putting ourselves behind the eight ball for potential runners lane um so i think i'm 100 percent point of the plate unless it's coming right from the pitcher and i take a side a step to either side just self-preservation in case he misses it um but yeah take it uh, point of the plate and then as as that catcher is coming up to throw from the point of the play, you can see that whole transfer. You can see inside the catcher's glove. You can see the free hand going in to get the ball. And then as he transfers and puts the ball in his, in his throwing hand, we just take a couple steps to our left. We're on first baseline extended, and we've got a perfect look at the at potential runner's lane um, and just slow everything down. That's yeah. way too fast. And it's kind of funny. The first play, we got a plate umpire who's too focused on the ball, and now we've got a play where the – plate umpire has no idea where the ball is yeah and yes if I was the base umpire I would be in fixing this uh before we even call time so we know the ball hits the ground but I want to talk a little bit about something here pre-pitch reads because this is really really important we know that if the ball is hit by based on where our third baseman and we can't my, my screen here, I'm going to guess the first baseman is up as well because I can't see that happen. He is, he's on the grid. That if a ground ball goes to the corners, it's going to come to the catcher in all likelihood, unless it drags him some way uh, towards second base because um, they're playing for two up the middle. So in this case, we have a ground ball right to the third base. We know that play's coming home, correct? We know that they're probably not going to turn two. That ball is bringing him to the catcher. So now we've already, we're not, we shouldn't be surprised by this play coming in. Um, and on this play, I also want you guys to look at where our guy in the middle is. Um, could he be a little closer in this particular play? Because if we do, for some reason, have a line drive to third base and it takes him towards third base, we're probably not going to be in a really good spot to see that play. So when we talk about pre-pitch reads, maybe you guys can speak to knowing that any play could happen at any given time. 
Yeah, and certainly I think the most common mistake when it comes to the base umpire positioning um, is a little bit too is guys are a little bit too deep in the B and C positions, the C position especially because when we're worried about third base, being forward um, is really going to help us out. I've but also plays that go into third. The closer we get to the, the baseline between second and third base, the harder time we're going to have uh, developing an angle onto that play into third. So probably the most common advice we give to umpires when it comes to the C position, and that's both in the two and three man system is we've got to move forward a little bit. And I think that that would probably be the case here, especially with our corner infielders playing up. And I, I know everybody thinks, well, this would never happen. I guarantee you the three of us have all been on the field for bases loaded, one out, a hard ground ball to third base, takes a third base, a step to the bag, he touches third. And then for whatever reason, he throws to the plate. Maybe there's zero outs. You know, just whatever reason, the guy just can't just follow business, standard order, go to first. He's got to come to the plate for a rundown play or something goofy happens. And this is why we're, you know, trying to just put all these ideas into your head to try to make it just slightly – uh, a better umpire. Well done. Uh, again, guys, anything last comments to add on this play uh, here? Other than one, just maybe one final thing. Uh, when, when we're talking about collision rule, if you've got a, this is expressed more in OBR than NCAA, but if you have a force play at the plate, uh, the catcher cannot be in violation, but you can also fall back on the, uh, uh, the catcher cannot be in violation if the throw originates from a drawn in infielder. Um, so don't, I know he was, uh, the catcher was in the runner's pathway, but there was nothing wrong with that because he's covered by two, uh, two parts of the rule in OBR and one part in NCAA. I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but I seem to remember, I think it was Central Michigan a couple of years ago on this type of play where the, it was a swipe tag at the plate on a force play, Brian, you might remember this, where the guy made contact of, oh, once again, I bring something up and I can't remember it's quite the specifics of it. I'll try to look it up and have a link in the comment section below. Let's move on to play number three before I talk about another play that nobody can remember. This is a simple game of cat and mouse. And I put this in here, guys, because this drives me nuts. I see this a lot on the college level of a pitcher who wants to work quickly and a batter who's slow and an umpire who doesn't really have control of the catcher or the game. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this because these are two players that know each other well and Johnny Cueto and, uh, and Para, uh, Baby Shark, as many people know him now. Um, and this is a pretty good umpire, Jim Reynolds, behind the plate, who can't seem to get on the same page here. We've all been part of this, where a batter and a pitcher and now a catcher. So how do we prevent this from happening, guys? This is, this is to Jeff. Yeah, this is a – I had a play similar, similar to this last year uh, in uh, at Mississippi State. It, uh, for some reason, made the NCAA video that next week. But uh, – <laughs> I, that, that was, this is one of the biggest, uh, one of the bigger, I should say, uh, transitions from professional baseball to co the college ranks is the, the catcher is not uh, recognizing the situation, just putting down signs, ready to go. Um, from, from this, initially, you know, there's no issue. It was just, you know, Parra was like, hey, my bad. You know, I, I, was, I wasn't ready. I wasn't set. Um, it, if this were me and, and uh, as the plate umpire, I'd probably hold off just a a touch longer to put the ball back in play. Um, you know, there's no problem with, with Cueto getting on the rubber, getting ready to go, um, and, and, you know, still having the hand up from calling time. I'm not saying using the time, you know, a do not pitch is without formally calling time. Um, just hesitate. You know, I would probably err on the side of hesitating a, a touch longer till I knew that Parra's uh, pre-pitch uh, – routine was, uh, you know, that he was ready. So right there, you know, Parr still got his hand up. Jimmy's pointing the ball in play. I would, I would err on the side of, of just waiting a, a second longer because then you can always bring it back. You know, if, if Cueto gets ready and Parr steps out, you've got your hand up. The camera sees everything. You can draw the attention away from these two guys going back and forth about, you know, what happened in, in winter ball 10 years ago when they were 15 year veterans of the league, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, it, it's, it's really not uh, – uh, it's, it's something that we should control as umpires. Um, and I, I, I just think that the, if we can control it, you know, be more proactive of, 
when we're putting the ball back in play, when, you know, if a batter's got his hand up. Um, and then for the lower levels, for college, if you've got a decent relationship, if you've had, you know, some communication with your catcher throughout the game, just tell him, be like, hey, Brian, just, you know, wait for the batter to be ready before you give a sign. And the interesting thing about this play, I don't know if you went back and noticed, uh, there was no sign given after the initial time, after the initial call time. Uh, who's that catching? Posey? He doesn't give another sign. Posey's looking around, looking down third base. He never gives another sign. So that's kind of, you know, you can usually try to steer the catcher like, hey, you know, wait to get put the sign down until the batter's ready. But in this instance, they're going with the same pitch. Posey's not even giving another sign. So you kind of, you kind of have to take the brunt of that as the umpire. You can't really try to coach them into uh, into holding up if if we're not putting a sign down. So this is a big point of emphasis in college baseball. We bring in uh, Brian DeBrower for his opinion on this play. I, I know talking to a catcher at a professional level is different than a collegiate level, but uh, Brian, we've worked midweek games together in the Northeast. Sometimes we have a third string catcher back there on a fun day and he doesn't, he's just so excited. He puts down the one sign, the guy ball's not in play yet. So he's, how can we make sure, Brian, that this doesn't turn into some kind of thing where a manager or a head coach, the case may be, is yelling at us, the catcher's mad at us, three batters are mad at us. These tend to blow up a lot quicker than people realize. Yeah, and I don't know that we can make sure. We can do the things that Jeff said, right? We can hold the ball up uh, from putting it in play just a little bit longer. We can talk to the catcher. Um, if, it's, if you recognize early that you're dealing with a, a less experienced catcher, I think that's a good opportunity to kind of walk them through like why we're doing that, right? So I'll say to them, hey, I'm just going to keep calling time if you guys are going too quickly. So why don't we just wait a second and let the batter get ready? And then I don't have to keep calling time all day and we can get back to playing baseball. So that's something that I've found myself doing more of in college baseball than in professional baseball. If I said that to a professional catcher, He'd probably turn around and laugh at me. Um, but if I say that to some freshman who's getting his first start of the season on a Tuesday midweek, he's going to appreciate the fact that I'm helping him out, that I'm communicating with him like a human being and kind of explaining my perspective on things. So that's the only thing I would add. Brian DeBrower, the director of training for United Umpires, Jeff Gosney, uh, in a similar capacity, you know, a lot of different titles and that, that stuff. Let's just tell you that these are two of the smartest brains when it comes to breaking down umpiring. Glad they were able to spend a few minutes with us. Let us know whether you like the video down below. We're going to drop this in a number of different locations. If you're listening on iTunes, please understand that this is a video. So you might want to check <laughs> us out on some of our other platforms. Until next time, when we'll do this again with these same two. This is uh, T-Max signing off. Until next time, happy umpiring, everyone.